Hey everyone, welcome to um, the Seeking Harmony live discussion. Um, we're very happy to be with you today. And yeah, we're going to talk about um, news that we found interesting and felt that were, were impacting to the world. And what we're going to focus on first is the impact of a few people that passed away um, at the end of the year, um, including Barbara Walters, um, the US journalist, is that it? Um, Feli, I don't know how you say that in English, but the, the Brazilian football player, soccer player, and yeah, Pope Benedict XVI. So yeah, basically I think we were kind of talking before the life began, and I think we do have a lot to say about these people, which is really um, an illustration of how much they impacted us. And so, yeah, um, I'm just going to ask you guys, who do you feel you want to start talking about? And do you feel there is a common thread um, between like all these figures and, and how you feel about them? I think we can continue on our conversation with Barbara Walters before we started the live. Um, her bulldozing her career and showing that influence and allowing herself to shine was a real um, trendsetter for the rest of history. So yeah, she is a remarkable woman. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Do you mind um, filling me on her story? Uh, because I don't really know her as a as a non-US citizen. Like, how was her life? I'm not that well versed as well, but as far as I've known, she started around the 50s. And one of the more remarkable things was that when she first started, she did not get the opportunity to write or speak about the male perspective or male um whoever, and she only spoke about women because that was what she was allowed to do. And when she first started getting televised, she uh, they had a rule that she could only speak on the fourth um, question. So there would have to be one, two, three, four questions, and then she could take her turn. So she was definitely a trailblazer in starting her um, career and making sure that she gave her um, impression and her energy as well. And I also remember that when she left one of her um, careers, she was mentioned only two years before she left. And before then she was not mentioned as, um, as one of the staff there and the reporter there. So yeah, she did, she always remarked about how grateful she was for the opportunity um, which was um, a great impression for me. And um, she was just very humble. But to find out that her twin flame was Donald Trump was is very shocking to me. But I do like the duality that we were discussing about her hiding some sides of her that Donald Trump definitely expressed. <laughs> And I'm oh, sorry, she was the first female broadcaster, is that it? Mm, yeah. yes. um, a couple with your story, it seems like, yeah, what Shulia was saying about her, like breaking the ceiling, uh, the glass ceiling for women is definitely true. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it feels like her, her greatest accomplishment in life spiritually or just period is how she just like didn't give up in pursuing what she really desired because yeah. she just really wanted to you know ask those questions and she really wanted to help reveal the story that was going on and help shed light on things that people otherwise wouldn't see 
and she wouldn't have been able to do it. Like she wouldn't have been able to do it to the extent that she did if she hadn't like really not given up. And if she hadn't um, pursued those opportunities that she did, because she would like do these specials where she was just um, one-on-one with someone just interviewing them. She was like um, allowed to do that. And of course, then she wouldn't be limited on how many questions she could ask, like you were saying. And that's what really catapulted her into the stardom that she enjoyed is that, like her pursuing that. And so I thought that was cool, you know, and also how um, in that big reunion on The View, I think, um, which she helped start, you know, the, the view, like all these ladies meeting and talking and sharing their view, their views, um, which is um, kind of similar to what we do, except we focus differently on the truth only. Um, she, you know, there was a big reunion of between her and like all these female journalists and they were thanking her for being the trailblazer that she was in journalism. And I feel like, um, you know, she just pursued her dreams and surrendered and it paid off a lot. And she was like, I didn't know that I was going to do this for women or I didn't do this knowing that it would be such a big breakthrough for women, but it did end up being that. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you were mentioning the one-on-one -on -one because not only was she the first, but she also had such a talent in eloquently speaking and her voice as a, as a uh, writer as well as a interviewer was like the Morgan Freeman of, you know, talking and his voice. So it was very calming as well as she really showed her emotions in the most eloquently way to engage the um, interviewer as well as the audience. So she was very talented as well. Yeah, I really respect her for staying true to herself and you know, never giving up on what she felt was the right path for her, uh, especially with all the odds that were stacked against her um, initially when she came into broadcasting. And I think like, I like even now her interviews with like heads of state are probably some of the best ones we've ever had, you know, from a US American um, news person and just the way she's able to, because I, I feel like the, the questions she asked were just unlike any other person that you were seeing uh, at that time. You know, she wasn't afraid to make people uncomfortable. She wasn't afraid to like really get to the, the core of the issue and I, and I think in her way in in her own way she was kind of a truth seeker even if maybe you know it wasn't like a conscious thing um I think that was always like one thing that she always like she always achieved through just being herself um and I I, I feel like she's just like a perfect example of being strong and powerful but also being you know very feminine and just kind of channeling that energy and um she's made space for a lot of other uh you know female broadcasters to to also thrive and flourish i don't think we'll ever see or we might maybe later on but it's going to be hard to uh to top barbara walters and um I definitely feel like she did a huge service, not only for American society, but just, you know, globally uh, for what she stood for. Um, and, you know, since like going back to like Donald Trump being her twin flame, I feel like the one thing that they have in common is like not being afraid to just like voice whatever, you know, whatever is in their hearts, whether you know, obviously Donald Trump kind of comes at it from a different place, but I, I feel like they they kind of did that uh, similarly. Like they they weren't afraid to just kind of be themselves, and however someone takes it, you know, it's it's their problem. So 
uh, I really respect her and, uh, and what she did. I like what you said about like, the fact that she wasn't a truth seeker, but in a way she, she did like seek more truth and, and more union for women in her sector and all of US society. And I think that's actually what the core of journalism should be. It's about truth seeking. It's not about being a columnist or writing about women to attract views and uh, audiences um, and things like that. It's about standing for what is right and also being yourself. And by doing so, presenting the view of the world that the people like want to know in a divine way, you know. And so obviously, like, journalism is far from perfect, but it's good to know that you have um, these figures that stand for the right thing, I would say. So that actually when when the whole of media makes the choice to change, they would have like some, I guess, examples of people that actually did it and that they can, a ground that they can stand on, you know? And uh, it's really good to know that um, some people do stand for the truth and do value. I think when you start journalism for most people, like you start hopeful, you start with like wanting to change things and, and at least when I was um, in college for social sciences, people that wanted to do journalism were kind of like that. And, and yeah, I think what she did was not just like enter journal journalism and kind of, kind of get sucked in to the way things worked and actually getting frustrated with like, oh, I am not able to, to change the thing. I'm obliged to do um, things the way people see in journalism. And she said like, no, journalism should be this way. And I want it to be this way. And so I'm gonna influence it because like nobody is gonna do it for me. And sh I think that's how she impacts me. I'm, because for like several years, I've seen like journalists and aspiring journalists always talking about their frustration of like not being able to actually do some investigation work, um, not cover things as they really desire to do, and just being kind of a slave to um, numbers and statistics and and what their direction wants um, to put forward and to see people like Walters saying, no, that's not actually what I want. And journalism should be about this. Like it, it, it kind of like feels right in my heart. It's like, oh, so this is possible. So if you truly want it, you can. You can actually change it. You can do it. You can not conform in a sense to what the direction wants you to do, which is like stats and audiences. You can actually value journalism and truth first. And so, yeah, I think it's, it makes me really hopeful for um, probably not this generation of, of journalism, but some generations that one day we'll say like, all right, we want things to change. And we want to focus on, on something else than um, heavy, clickbaity, um, half truths, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's my that's my feeling. <laughs> that was a lot, but yeah. Speaking of glass um, ceiling breakers and trendsetters, Pele also reminds me of like that being the king of football 
or they call it the eternal king of football and all of his remarkable strides. I don't know much about him, but I do know he was one of the youngest players to go to the World Cup, as well as um, one of the youngest players in the league and really influencing the biggest players there are now, especially Ronaldo, Messi, and uh, Neymar. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm not that informed about Pele. What about you guys? <laughs> I've I've been a fan of his for, you know, ever since I was young and uh I mean, I feel like he just I mean, he was truly born to play football and I also think like you know, to to, to just show that you can be great but also have this humility and, um, you know, respect and love for your, your, you know, your fellow athletes and like from the country you come from, you know, your, I think what he embodied so well and what you really don't see um, at that level of sport and just, you know, athletes is that like, he never lost sense of who he was. He never lost sense of his roots. Um, you know, he lived a very humble life. And uh, just like, you know, I think the first time he even like had contact with the sport was like, he had a makeshift soccer ball. I think it was just like a bag of sand or something. Um, you know, cause he, he was born into a impoverished family but from like the second that his feet touched that, it was just like magic. And um, I feel like his path was so clear from the beginning and it's, and he just like set a really nice example for other athletes. Cause you know, as we've talked about before, there's a lot of corruption in sports and, you know, FIFA has had scandals. Um, but just to see that like another choice can be made that, you know, you don't have to be um, kind of like a rich snobby athlete that you can, you know, love the sport and like give back and still do well for yourself and still be successful. Um, you know, I, I really, once again, I respect him also for just staying true to himself and like being authentic and, choosing love. Cause I, I feel like, you know, and obviously I don't know all the, the inner workings of his interpersonal life or anything of that, but just from what I uh, know of him, it seems like, um, that, that choice was being made that, you know, he, he didn't choose the ego when times, uh, call for it, you know, he chose love. There was a lot of like, he, I feel like he was like a, a person that brought people together, you know, and one of the articles that I was reading, um, I guess like the way he spoke Portuguese was also very unique because at the e end of every sentence, he would always say, understand, or do you understand? And so I, I feel like it was just a sign that of his need to just like have a connection with people and to kind of unite uh, individuals from like different backgrounds and I really respect him for what he did, not only for, you know, soccer, but like the, the country of Brazil, the fact that he was a black man, I think was also like a huge deal, um, especially with, you know, the racial tensions that have been present in that country. And I think he's just given hope to a lot of people that come from similar backgrounds. Um, and I really, I really love him for what he, what he accomplished. And just who he was, not just his accomplishments. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. yeah. I was just gonna mention that he was declared a national treasure for Brazil, as he should be. And his uh, philanthropy speaks for himself through humanitarian efforts as well as the Amazon. So for someone to be so involved in the football world while also knowing the societal and environmental um, impacts that he could make and he made those was truly remarkable and I can see why you love him. <laughs> it's the epitome of divine purpose for me. 
it's like um it's very straightforward you know when you feel into his energy it's just like yeah it's not like football in in uh in the sense of oh i gotta be the best or i gotta win this or win that it's just it just did what he loved and it was just like the, you can feel the desire of god in it and it's crazy because i was watching um tifa's class today and it said that you can be spiritual and wear sweatpants and and uh, mm-hmm. be into like video games and things like that and i think for me Pele is that it's like this like person that um has the desire of god in his heart in a very innocent and straightforward manner in terms of purpose at least and he follows that and it's just like it's natural and everyone can feel the divine essence in him and i think that's why a lot of like football players that are amongst the best um at the moment um follow his lead in terms of like how to play and uh, tactics of football and things like that and i think i see that a lot with with artists too with musicians um following like geniuses i think what they should take from his life and his teaching and education should not be his tactics because they they are very unique to him but just the sense that he was himself and that was enough and i think um athletes would be even better players if they actually follow the core of that not just like watching him from the outside but definitely focusing on what it was on the inside and the message of them the message that he he was sharing via football, which was not actually about football, but about being yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, um, yeah, no, I was wondering too. I think I read in one article, it was saying that like he didn't um, get paid very much comparatively. To other footballers like maybe earlier in his career is that correct or yeah I thought that was yeah I thought that was interesting is that true Yorin? um yeah because it was like I think that's kind of the same with like women and black women in tennis for example it's just why it was the first black man in in national leagues in Brazil and so his pay wasn't comparatively um, gigantic compared to other people. But then like it's like Barbara Walters. People um, eventually had to respect him and value him for what he was mm. because it was definitely when you've done like several World Cups um, and on like national teams and international teams. Um, people can help but value you but I think his beginnings weren't easy and that's also one of the things that we talked about before the live and I think can be applied to Jeff and Soya and also our community too is like when you're great you're gonna attract a flock of haters or some resistance and things like that but eventually if you continue to to shine like people can help but see it and recognize it not because they're obliged but just because it's divine and it's the truth and the truth always comes out Mm. yeah i I just wanted to mention one more thing about his um performance and the way he would make his goals were just very unique and not many people can mimic that kind of skill level. Like he was the best when it came to divine purpose, but he also had that unique expression that was just, you know, truly divine. Yeah. Yeah. That's honestly why I love him so much as a player. It's like poetry in motion, like just watching him. It was, I mean, like it's, it's rare to see 
in my opinion, I feel like it's rare to see people that really like embody that divinity when they're, you know, doing anything. And uh, among athletes, like I think like Serena Williams is another person that comes to mind. Like, I think she really embodies the essence of like, it's just, it's just part of who she is. It's so innate. And uh, I mean, as an athlete myself, I just love watching people that can move like that. And it's just so beautiful and fluid, but so powerful at the same time. It's yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I feel like he, he paved the way for the stardom of oh, so many like football or soccer players. I think they stand on his shoulders. I think he like, he created the template for what a a great internationally playing football star can be. And I think that through his life, it seems like he made some, some progress and you know, that whole dichotomy between like people feel there's, there's either, two, there's two things like either you're doing something like for the money and you're like really rich or you're just humbly doing something out of love for it, but you like don't get compensated as well. And those two things obviously don't need to like be separate. Like you can be like, not, you can be like loving, kind, humble, do something that you love to do for love, but still be like really well compensated. And I think that he, I, I would like say that he definitely deserves even more that of recognition and just claiming his value and experiencing like being valued because of like the huge contribution he had and just well just that he's yeah just that we're like he's like and we're all like inherently valuable and that he really claimed that value and he just but based his whole life on that and that I'm glad he made some progress in that that he could like be that be himself be his do his divine like passion and like get paid well for it, you know, too, because he need he needs that support, like living in a really low budget way when you're a huge superstar, like channeling all that energy, it's not healthy for you. And like, I don't know if he lived in a super low budget way, but the article seemed to say that he lived kind of humbly what I read. And I was like, I don't think that's like healthy because you've got to be supported like all this, the nice stuff. It's not just vanity or like, oh, my God, look, I can afford like um, um, this Lamborghini or, oh, my God, look at my house. It's not about that. It's about it gives to you something that you need to give your gift more. And, you know, I just hope that like he claims that and everything. But yeah. I wonder if that affected maybe his health and why he was, you know, struggling with cancer. And I think he had some like hip problems as well. Um, you know, just on an energetic level, if he never really claimed that support or just like claimed that worth within him, I could definitely see it like translating physically in the body. Yeah, I guess so, because like, I don't know if there's, there are a lot of people in the world that know how to give in a very balanced way. And I know like, even though he was among like the athletes that probably should be named to have like a, um, a healthy relationship with sports, um, a lot of athletes and artists are not giving in a very balanced way. So not being supported on top of that, might not have been have been good because like well I guess it could have lived longer so it's like um in terms of health I don't know it's it feels like there's um definitely still something to heal about burning out of your energy and dying young because you've given everything to your craft and yeah, I don't know how much it played out for him. Maybe it was other things, but like, yeah, hearing a few years ago that he battled with cancer was definitely 
a hard hit. It's like we can see the pattern of uh, people being known and then stopping their careers because they have health problems and and then dying. So yeah, definitely something that we're healing in consciousness, I guess. Yeah. But like also just a beautiful legacy too, you know. Yeah. Right. And so last figure of the day. Pope Benedict 16th, 16th or the 16th? Yeah, I'm so glad. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you guys brought up the health issue because it transitions well into Benedict. Mm. But yeah, to think that one is not um, receiving all of their good can definitely translate into the body. But I think for Benedict the 16th, his case, it may be different of why he got cancer because they both suffered cancer, but probably for two different reasons, maybe similar, but different, um, manifested differently. I know that he was part of the scandal um, about a decade ago or even longer ago. And maybe that was why it was, he was the first in six decades to resign the way he did, of course, for his health, but probably due to that as well. And it may have manifested in that with his illness. And so, yeah, we see two different polarities of one doing so good and living your divine purpose but not being able to receive your good and it manifesting in your body. And then we see another one where you were called to do the divine and you didn't live it up to that divine purpose. And you see how it manifested in your body as well. It could have been the guilt or the burden afterwards, but either way, we definitely see a manifestation of dis, dis ease within the body, regardless of how righteous you were or not yeah yeah i think that's kind of where uh he may differ from walters and pele I, th I i feel like he hadn't an opportunity to do more and really bring some healing to the catholic church because you know they've been they've been struggling with uh this issue of like child sex abuse for for so long now and um you know although he made strides maybe in like uniting catholics and non-catholics and uh you know kind of paving ways in that area i think where it mattered the most um was this issue of uh you know child sex abuse and you know maybe taking like a good hard look at the Catholic Church itself and the sort of rules and regulations they have, like, you know, the whole celibacy thing, a lot of people have argued is like a huge factor that drives why, you know, priests abuse children. You know, the, it's, I mean, we're all created with a twin flame. We all uh, desire to be loved and express that love physically. Like, you know, it's unnatural, in my opinion, to not allow someone to like, fully have that you know relationship with a lover and to be able to express it and of course it's gonna and I think sex abuse is a form of disease it's it's manifested you know obviously in a different way than like cancer or something else but there's an imbalance there and it's being translated into uh you know men in powerful positions abusing very vulnerable uh you know vulnerable children and so i i mean although you know he's he's a respected figure and i mean honestly i, I don't know too much about his his personal life and you know i was raised in a muslim household so like catholicism is not very familiar to me um but you know, my sense is that he he could have done more 
God was perhaps calling him to do more in those moments. And he chose not to, he chose to support the, the status quo. And to your point, Nadia, you know, maybe that is why he resigned, why he felt like it was, you know, necessary to do that. And maybe he did carry some internal guilt or shame around that, that perhaps translated physically. Um, but yeah, I think he's very different from the, these two people, other people that we've been talking about in, in that way specifically. I, I think there's something there about like, um, well, first of all, it feels different also catholicism is like a spiritual path that is a bit different than the ones on, on twin flames so people actually made sacred vows of chastity there so it's not during their earth life at least so it's definitely not the same quite different and um what it feels like is that pope benedict and his rule on like the Catholic Church. What is different from the others is that his history is linked to the history of many people. So his impact, um, hearing from you both, is actually linked to um, the impact of everyone under him um, in the Vatican and the Catholic Church. And I think there were and what you're translating is that there probably still he's a bit of upset about like the way why he resigned but also i do seem to recall um that god maybe was not calling him to resign but also that he maybe felt that he wasn't like the right person to handle all of that which is kind of I don't know if it's like quitting or if he was like very humble there. And I don't think we know the whole truth about it all. Um, and that there's still some truth to be uncovered because the Vatican, especially the Vatican and uh, a lot of the Catholic church is like a very, 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 very hard thing to move because there are a lot of people under it and there are a lot of, things in the Vatican that are um, procedures and processes that are not the sole responsibility of the Pope. So definitely feels like he could have done more, but like, oh, here's someone. Um, definitely feels like we could, he could have done more, but at the same time, seeing um pope francis right now and even even john paul um at the time and the way it took years to really approve decisions i feel like there's a big healing in catholicism to be had and also a lot of compassion because um it's not a, it's not an easy position. <laughs> what I was always feeling about that when I was young, because I come from a Catholic family, is that when you resign, there was an energy of like, kind of like we said um, last week about like uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, there is something in leadership that is like so much pressure, and sometimes when you call it in, maybe you're not ready or. Maybe you feel a bit of fear and things like that. And so not to excuse what, what may have happened or not happened, but I do feel like being a Pope, like how much pressure and spiritual energy must that be? Like seeing how his... Um, people were, that were before him and Pope Francis, how everything can manifest in the body just because you have um, the consciousness of so many people in your like vibrational field 
like I don't know and it's like when I think about it it's just like a lot and so I feel like there is um there are choices that must be made and there must be bravery in choosing differently than what is done traditionally in the church and maybe it was a bit more traditional than the person that was before him and the person that is after him and that might have played in not making these decisions but there is also a lot of like just a lot catholic church is a lot yeah yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because he also mentioned how he was introverted and it took a lot of him to continue on his services, especially near the end before he was about to resign. So especially someone who called that in may not have been ready for that. And um, yeah, but it also speaks to the sense that everyone has access to speak to the divine. In, the, in their most clearest divine way, regardless of, you know, whatever they may choose to do. And so he, when he resigned, I remember uh, him saying that he spoke to God and this was the best thing for him. So maybe he did speak to God and God was like, hey, I think it's time's up or I think you did what you needed to do and it was ready for that. And um, maybe mm -hmm. sometimes he decided to ignore God and sometimes he did side to listen but mm -hmm. I think the transition from him to the next pope was um there's no other way to describe it but divine because it opened up the channel for such a more uh innovative and um different type of pope as far as I know because I know Pope Benedict was not open to the LGBTQ community or um, other communities other than, he was very conservative as a Catholic. So I'm glad he started to make those transitions and shift, um, whereas there was such rigid, rigidity beforehand, so. Yeah, that's beautiful what you said. And I think people mentioned that he was very close to Pope Jean-Paul II, Jean-Paul II, the second. Um, and that may have been why he was elected. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe that was not the right decision or maybe that was, we don't know what God's plan were, were, were for, uh, for him. And also we could definitely feel the wave of new energy with Pope Francis. And that might, that might be from uh, him being Argentinian and um, having a culture of like really like physically embracing people and being warm and uh, very different from uh, Pope Benedict. And also he was definitely from a bunch of, actually I learned that recently of um, traditionalists. So people that respected more um, of the dogma that was before uh, the law of Vatican II, that was like before the 60s. So the old church, there is like Latin, um, women covering with headscarves and dressing very demurely and things like that. So yeah, it was about his culture as well. Like there was a cultural shift of um, a shift of popes, I guess. Speaking of shifts of um, leadership, um, our next topic is the El Chapo and El Chapo's son and the tragedy that happened on both sides of, uh, I think there was 29 people that were killed um, trying to retrieve El Chapo's son when he was arrested. So, <laughs> what yes. are your thoughts on that? Um. I just think it's really interesting that you said, you said it that way, like a transition of leadership, because this is the case with both. So the Sinaloa drug cartel was led by El Chapo for so long. And he, you know, like, I guess a lot of leadership was transferred to his son, um, Ovidio. 
And also, of course, the Mexican government has had a transition too, you know, since El Chapo um, finally met his um, legal downfall and got extradited to the US. Um, like now there's a new administration in Mexico and stuff. And I don't, I don't know very much about that, but maybe there's been a shift in the mentality of the leadership or its skills or something, because I think they're handling the threat of, they're negotiating this, this conflict much better than before, because they made sure that like El Chapo, he was like famous for when he was captured, I think twice or so in Mexico, he was in like high security prison and he basically like was famous for escaping and he like bought off all the prison guards and he got like luxury goods smuggled into the prison and he was like giving orders to the drug cartel from prison and it was just a big just a big pageant of bullshit and it was just um completely just it showed deep corruption and issues. And I was just like, oh, come on, you guys, like <laughs> we need to crack down on this. And then once he finally like got extradited to the US, then when his son took over, now that his son was was arrested, um, they immediately like flew him to the capital so that there wouldn't be like, you know, these struggles between cartel supporters and the police and the military. So I think that that's good. And I think that they're learning and there's a test coming up because he has to be tried in the Mexican legal system before he can be extradited to the US. So that's one area where there could be some wiggle room for the cartels to do something. But yeah, I don't know. So it makes me feel like maybe, cause I know sometimes in in Mexico, there was like this codependency with the cartels and with local government and with people because the cartels being so rich monetarily um, could like fund public infrastructure projects and get politicians elected and keep things moving in society where government wasn't doing so. So there is almost this feeling that it was part, it's part of, of Mexico and there's this but conflict battle going on in Mexico is to like, do we choose that or do we choose to phase that out and, you know, to not rely on that at all or not include that at all in our society. And I think that that's like, I feel like that's what's going on there. I'm very passionate about this topic because I've just heard so much about it through my years of like being a teacher and hearing kids um, talk about it who were from Mexico and just seeing everything going on there. I'm just like, I really would love justice to be served there. So that's why I was like on this one. So what do you guys feel about it? It's very interesting. Yeah. And um, I think you have some of your facts right because um, about like the dependency to cartels because well the government first of all um the new government is very i wouldn't say cutthroat but very direct very uh, so first of all that analysis was good <laughs> and mm -hmm. um it's not like not everyone is a big fan of the government but i think in many like places in latin america and the caribbean the problem is that when a government is like very direct and wanting to change things, we are met with a lot of resistance, either because of corruption or because people think that the government is against them and pro some other culture. And when government, uh, the actual, the current president, is not very kind of on like historians and people that want to protect like the maya's runes and uh, things like that so um a lot of people are rallying to the more alternative side of society i would say i'm not a pro about that but it does feel like that 
even though the government is really about like, hey, it's time to get Mexico back on its feet and without drug cartels, cartels and um, other things that um, actually leak energy from the country. But their endeavor is um, on one side successful because they've got like El Chapo, they've got El Chapo right now, which is a uh, pretty good, pretty big, but shadowed by um, yeah the drug cartels and uh, the people who died, and and actually the resistance is kind of like. Mm, about the um, Mexican citizens about like oh we don't know but things were, were good there and we had secondary benefits and things like that you know what I mean it's like this feeling of um, the people want change and the world better they want heaven but they're not ready to let go of some of the things that maybe were beneficial to them or maybe there there's a fear of change and um, yeah it's making the whole situation very difficult and we would very much like to see Mexico get out of um, this situation. And we would love, actually, I'm with you on this stage. We would love to see Mexican like, news and history not being so linked to the daily lives of with um, gangsters and drug cartels everywhere. But the sad news is that it's actually daily life for many people and it's we're so over it like <laughs> it's time for it to go but there is still some healing I feel um to be done for a lot of Mexican people yeah I like what you said about the Mexican government being very like cutthroat uh, it feels like they're trying to cut dependencies very cold turkey. And um, this may be a methodology that they need. They, it may be something that is very strict and will like erupt within the Mexican population. And we see that there's a lot of protests, I think even a month ago on the new electoral um, system that they're trying to build. Um, the one thing I'm thinking of is that Mexico and America has uh, developed a partnership that is going forward of how to redevelop their image. And although this is great, I'm wanting to see what is America's reasoning for this to be so influential. I mean, of course, we do have trade. And almost everything is like we are neighbors. So I hope that it's always in good intention when they are trying to influence these next steps with Mexico. Although I think that the Mexican government's intentions are in the right place, especially showing that like, hey, we have El Chapo, we don't want to be known as this anymore, but also thinking that they're not putting much importance in the Mayan ruins and other historical things is like, but that's very heart and core of Mexico that should be valued very much. So I hope they find a good balance between American influence and what they think the partnership should be, as well as keeping their roots and really um, embodying their core or redeveloping their core to you know, shine through. Yeah, um, I feel like right. there's a lot of healing to be done on like how cultures should be viewed. Um, we've talked about it several times, but like not associating your culture with ego, um, but still keeping the good things. And yeah, like every time we talk about it, I'm gonna repeat it that like people of color have a lot of work to to do on that so yeah um, I think there is a lot of compassion to be had as well for the healing that is needed there yeah just like claiming divinity and knowing that like I understand the mistrust because in Mexico and in Central America 
um, the government had been seen a lot of the times as like selling out to elites, like elite, elite interests in the country, elite foreign interests, like the U S you know, like how many like government, um, how many like military coups and government changes in Central America were supported by the US on the behalf of like fruit companies because these fruit companies were saying like, hey, can you help us get a government regime that's favorable to us? We need our plantations to, you know, make a good profit and just stuff like that. And because of that, there's like distrust and I totally, I think that that's part of this um, this controversy, like why it feels like there's so much conflict and there's lack of clarity um, about the situation. And yeah, it just needs compassion and um, just healing. And yeah, that realization that like the, the, you know, the people who are leading these like drug cartels and stuff, like, while they seem to be like an alternative to a mistrusted government, they're also not true heroes, you know, even though like they have that image, you know, sometimes. And I feel like that's the whole like question that's being like talked about there. Yeah, that reminded me of Stockholm Syndrome. It's like you realize that like, oh, this is such a comfortable and wonderful home. And you all of a sudden remember like, oh wait, <clears throat> I've been trapped in here and um, this is actually not my home and this is not actually comfortable. So I'm getting, um, I'm impressed that they're reawakening to their own Stockholm syndrome. I mean, the people. And maybe the government is kind of shaking things up so that they can awaken to that. Very good. And good. Stockholm syndrome, sorry. And Stockholm syndrome with America too, like, and other people of power, like Sage was saying, like not just the government, but also with other influences of like uh, really standing in their power and recognizing their power and influence. Very true, because we're a powerful country, but again, I don't think they see it that way. Okay. Yeah, drifted conflict, guys. We are at the hour. Yeah, I do feel complete. Uh, congratulations to Mexico for getting El Chapo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was really good conversation. Um, very interesting. Um, thank you and thank you to everyone who watched us live and who's watching us from youtube if you liked our content don't hesitate to like the video and subscribe to our channel to stay updated on the many conversations and services that we have on there yeah and take care see you later bye bye thank you thank you